what's up youtube welcome to this video my name is car janelle as you see by the title it's called the spirit of absalom dealing with the narcissist spirit so oftentimes i hear this term narcissist thrown around you know for years now this term has like been a big thing and i found myself asking god you know seeking god to see is this um term narcissist is this anything that can be found in the bible and after praying about it for a while the Lord brought me upon the story of Absalom. And when he brought me upon the story of Absalom, this was a couple months ago, at least two months ago, I didn't understand why. I couldn't understand why I was reading about Absalom, why I was in the book of 2 Samuel, why I kept coming upon, you know, these chapters about Absalom. And I was really like, really didn't understand it. I didn't understand what it was, you know, of course, the word is the word and it's always beneficial, but I didn't feel like how it was edifying me at that moment so i kept you know coming back to it and really started trying to see god to see you know why he was bringing me upon the story of absalom and i believe the reason why was be an answer to my question when i was asking god you know were there anyone who embodied these attributes of narcissism in the bible and i'm not making this video to condemn anyone so i hope no one's offended by this but more so to bring light to um you know these attributes and these spirits and how they even operated in people in the bible particularly absalom who we're going to get to and before i even get into the video i want to make it known that if you're dealing with someone who's a narcissist be it a family member be it a friend be it whoever um of course it's not these particular people but the spirits that are operating through them and the bible tells us we don't wrestle against flesh and blood so this might be beneficial to someone who is dealing with um people in their life who may be operating out of these spirits and also most importantly i feel is you can get prayer points of what to pray against because it's one thing to do a general prayer but it's another thing to hit prayer points rebuking and binding spirits um like particular spirits when you when you go before god and pray to him so we're going to get into this um story of absalom and it's located in second samuel and we're going to read a few chapters in there. We're going to read it straight from um, the Bible, of course, not my physical Bible here, but we're going to read it online so I can show my screen to you guys. And we're also going to get into what a narcissist is, because if you've heard this term before and you don't necessarily know what it is, we're going to describe it. So this is kind of like a combination of a few definitions that I read online and um a narcissist is pretty much described as someone whose personality traits include a sense of entitlement, a lack of empathy, um, a need for admiration, manipulative, grandizing, envy and belittlement, arrogance, and a lack of accountability with the need of constant attention and admiration. They're also someone who's in need of control. So there are people in the Bible who embody these traits, even though we're going to discuss specific people. We know that the Bible tells us we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So it's not necessarily the people themselves, but the wicked spirits operating in them. And as we get into the story of Absalom, there's going to be a few parallels because um, not only are the spirits that were operating in Absalom in the word, you know, you can point out this particular spirits and we're going to get into that. But also there's a lot of parallels between the spirits that were operating in Absalom and, uh, and ultimately the spirits that were operating in Satan. And that's very blunt. And I don't want people to get offended, but it might be a hard watch for some people if you're someone who operates in these spirits or even if you're someone dealing with someone like this because nobody really wants to hear that. But of course, um, you know, we receive the word to be edified. And sometimes when you point these particular things out in the spirit and you pray against them, you know, these demons have to flee at the name of Jesus. And once you realize that it's a demon and it's a spirit, they got to bow to the most high. But nevertheless, there are some parallels between Satan and the spirits that were operating in Absalom. Because in the book of Ezekiel chapter 38, when it goes into the attributes of Satan, you're going to see this parallel. And we're also going to get into that. So I'm going to start right in the beginning um, where pretty much we first start well i don't i'm not going to say first but when absalom started playing like this big role and this is located in um hold on this is located in second samuel we're going to start at um verse chapter 13 and we're going to start at the very end of this 
this chapter because the story about um tamar and you know how she got raped by her brother and all these things by ammon this this praise a particular part but for time's sake we're going to go straight into absalom so i wanted to bring up the origin like where these where the sea really started i feel where the sea really started um like in the word how you know you want to see the origin behind like when you watch a superhero movie you want to see the origin of why these evil superheroes are like how this became this way you know so tamar got raped tamar being absalom's sister by got raped by her brother her half brother ammon and um this is where the seed was planted in absalom so it says we're going to start uh second samuel chapter 13 we're going to start right at the bottom Let me see what verse I want to start in. Bear with me because I wasn't going to read this chapter, but I decided it was important to like bring up, you know, the, um, the origin of like where this seed was planted and how this started. So after, um, Ammon, you know, raped Tamar, um, he pretty much like didn't want her after that. And it was of course a shame for this, not only this woman, but his sister and a daughter of the king to be taken advantage of by this person. And then the person didn't want her anymore. Ammon was like, okay, I don't, I don't want her get away from me. Go out in your shame. I don't care. And, um, let's start at verse number 20. It says, and Absalom, her brother said unto her, hath Ammon, thy brother been with thee, but hold now thy peace, my sister, he is thy brother, regard not this thing. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very wroth. And Absalom spake unto his brother Ammon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Ammon. Now this is this is the part right here. Because when we want to figure out like where this seed started, it started with the seed of hate. Absalom hated his brother for what he had done right verse number 22 and it came to pass after two full years that absalom had sheep sharers and in belhazar which is beside ephraim and absalom invited all the king's sons and absalom came to the king and said behold now thy servant hath sheep sharers let the king i beseech thee and his servants go with thy servant and the king said unto absalom nay my son let us not all go let us not all now go, lest we be chargeable unto thee. And he pressed him, howbeit he would not go, but blessed him. Then Absalom, then said Absalom, if not, I pray thee, let my brother Ammon go with us. And the king said unto him, why should he go with thee? So now you need to get into, when we start talking about the narcissist, now you need to start remembering the definition that we brought up watch how absalom is operating because now he's operating and being very manipulative he comes to the king with this story of like okay we're gonna go over to bell bell hazard and um i got some sheep sharers over there and i want y'all to come with me and the king was like nah you know we're not going for it so now he persists to keep asking because one thing about the narcissist spirit they want to get their way it's a big need for control like it has to be their way it has to be the way that they want it and as we get further into this, we're going to, of course, I told you, um, show how this embodies attributes of Satan. But nevertheless, Absalom keeps going to the king like, okay, well, you know, let Ammon come with me. And in verse 27, but Absalom pressed him that he let Ammon and all the king's sons go with him. So Absalom wasn't taking no for an answer. Absalom was like, no, nah, I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to keep pressing him. I'm going to keep being persistent to get what it is that I want. Not knowing the king probably didn't know. He might've felt some way. That's why he was saying no. He might've had some discernment or some inkling like, nah, this, this is sounding weird to me. But Absalom keeps, you know, 
being persistent into what it is that he wants because he already had an evil motive. He hated Absalom. The Bible told us that. He hated Ammon. The Bible already told us that. So why does he want him to go? Now, Absalom had commanded his servants saying, make ye now when Ammon's heart is merry with wine. And when I say unto you, smite Ammon, then kill him. Fear not, have not I commanded you. Be courageous and be valiant, valiant. So Ammon has went to the king like, hey, you know, let my brother come with me, King David. And he then after he finally gets Ammon to come, he tells, Absalom tells his servants, we're going to, I want you guys to kill um, Ammon. I want you guys to kill him. And the servants of Absalom did unto Ammon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose and every man got him up upon his mule and fled. So what I really want you guys to see here is the fact that Absalom was very manipulative. Absalom was very persistent to get what he wanted in order to enact this evil plan. In order for him to do what it is that he wanted done, he was persistent and manipulating the king to let him take Ammon with him in the first place. And then he had this evil plan, this evil desire to do something. But mind you, as we read earlier in this chapter, he had a seed of hate implanted in him for what was done to his sister. He had a seed of hate implanted in him for what was done to Tamar. And ultimately it seems like Another thing with control, he didn't like how King David dealt with the situation, probably because he decided to take it into his own hands. His father being the king, his father um, being King David, you know, I guess didn't do what Absalom felt should have been done. And he had the seed of hate in him. And we know a seed of hate is not of God. It's not, you know, the Bible tells us about repentance. The Bible tells us about love. It tells us about all these things. So where did that seed of hate come from? Put that as a question in your mind as we continue on. So the servants fled and verse number 30, and it came to pass while they were in the way that tidings came to David saying, Absalom has slain all the king's sons and there is none, there is not one of them left. Okay, verse 31. And the king arose and tear his garments and lay on the earth and all his servants stood by with their clothes rent. And... Jonah, Jonadab, the son of Shammai, David's brother, answered and said, let not my Lord suppose the son of David's brother. So that's like his nephew. Let not my Lord suppose that they have slain all the young men. Oh, Too far, man. How do you sleep at night? Oh, Get matched that mattress for him. Sleep at night. Sorry about that. There's like ads on this Bible app, but um, we're going to continue. Where were we? Verse 32. And Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah, David's brother, answered and said, Let not my Lord suppose that they have slain all the young men, the king's sons. For Ammon only is dead. For by the appointment of Absalom, this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. So Jonadab is coming to tell King David like, nah, all your kids aren't dead. It's just Ammon. And it's telling us here in the word that Absalom, remember he had a seed of hate. The Bible told us that he hated his brother Ammon from that day for what he had did to his sister. So when we talk about narcissists, when you go back to the origin, there's some, some type of seed there that allows, cause the Bible says the curse causes can't come. So there had to be some type of open door. There had to be some type of something going on there for these spirits to even embody this person in the first place. And it said that Ammon hated his brother, right? Absalom hated Ammon, his brother, sorry. So now it's telling us that, all right, Absalom wanted Ammon killed. And it said, for by the appointment of Absalom, this had been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. So what do we get from that right there? Just reading about, okay, he hated his brother Ammon. 
right, from that moment that he did that, this was already predetermined. He manipulated the situation with King David to even let his brother go to do what he had, pre the evil that was already predetermined. And I want to make known again, I know I'm saying he, but these spirits that were operating in him, I'm going to keep trying to make that known because, of course, it's not the person, but it's the spirits that are operating in them. So it's saying this has been determined. This has been determined from the day that he did what he did, the day that um, Ammon raped Tamar, Absalom had determined he was going to kill him. He was going to do something about the situation. Too far, man. How do you sleep that night? Oh, that's it. That's it. Oh, it's kind of cool. Look, I don't know where these ads that's are coming it. from. Get matched at mattress for him. Sleep at night. And I'm trying to find it. All right. Let's finish this chapter because there's a few more chapters to get in when it comes to this story about Absalom. Verse number 33. Now, therefore... Let not my lord, the king, take this thing to his heart to think that all the king's sons are dead for only for Ammon only is dead. But Absalom fled and the young men that kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, there came much people by the way of the hillside beside him. And Jonadab said unto the king, behold, the king's sons come as Thy servant said, so it is. So now Jonah, Jonadab is like, look, it's not all your sons that are dead. And now all the sons are showing up saying like, and Jonadab's like, okay, I told you it wasn't all of them. And here they come now. Verse number 36. And it came to pass as soon as he had made an end of speaking that behold, the king's sons came and lifted up their voice and wept. And the king also, and all his servants wept very sore. But Absalom fled and went to Telmai, Telmai, the son of Amahud. We're down here in verse number 37. Amahud, the king of Geshar. And David mourned for his son every day. So, of course, another thing with this narcissist spirit, as we read the definition earlier, these people don't take accountability for anything that they do. So not only, um, we, I'm going to keep bringing it up. It started with this seed of hate, which ultimately a seed of hate comes from bitterness un and unforgiveness because you can't help hate someone you forgave. All right. And then you're bitter about the situation because Ammon, I mean, Absalom decided to take it in his own hands to plot revenge. And he had determined that from the very moment that this, this, that he found out about the situation. So he was being very manipulative. He's not going to take accountability for his actions, right? He's not going to take a, a lack of empathy also. I want to bring that up because we read that in the definition, um, a lack of empathy. So he didn't think about all his other brothers. The word is telling us the, the brothers were weeping. David's weeping. Everyone else is crying about the situation. This person, he doesn't feel any remorse for it because He's not going to take um, accountability for his action. He's unfled and went somewhere else, right? Verse number 38. So Absalom fled and went to Geshar and was there three years. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Ammon, seeing he was dead. So King David loved his sons. He loved his sons, and he still is mourning and feeling some way in his heart about Absalom. Ammon had died, so it's saying, like, he was comforted knowing, like, okay, my son is not just out there, you know, going through something, but he's, he's, he's dead, he's resting, so he was comforted in that sense, but as for Absalom, King David's heart was still longing for him because that was still his son, and he still loved him, and when it comes to King David, that's showing a real, a real heart of forgiveness, that's showing, like, look, you did something that hurt me, you did something that hurt me, but I'm still longing for your well-being. I'm still longing, like wanting to know if you're okay. I'm still longing for you. And um, this brings us back to when it comes to, um, you know, it's saying in verse 39, and the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Ammon, seeing he was dead. Um, when we go back to the story of David and Bathsheba, when they had that first son, in their adultery and whatever it is that they were doing, which I'm not going to get too deep into, 
um, the first son ended up dying when Bathsheba came up pregnant and King David plotted that whole event, which is another thing we need to kind of indicate. Although King David was a man after God's own heart and we see that he, he fell into repentance um, after the situation. And he came into repentance when the servant came and told him like this scenario and he recognized like, okay, I did something wrong. And he fell into repentance. This is a heart of repentance, a heart of a heart of repentance is, is something that God likes, I believe, because if David being a man after God's own heart had done these things, then of course God was willing to forgive when he fell into repentance. But the story that I want to bring up and one more point that I want to bring up is David tried to manipulate that situation when it came to Bathsheba. And after he got Bathsheba pregnant, he tried to have her husband killed off. And he kept manipulating the situation. And this is a an attribute that Ammon is kind of walking in. You know, the worldly term is when they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But spiritually, you know, um, when we talk about generational curses or generational tendencies and traits and things like that, David... Although he was a man after God's own heart and we see that he fell into repentance after this, this is not something that he can, like he was continuing to operate in. He also was very manipulative because he tried to manipulate that situation with Bathsheba to have her husband Uriah killed. And when Uriah was so faithful to the cause, so faithful as a soldier, instead of going home and sleeping with his wife so that David and Bathsheba could basically blame um, Uriah will not blame, but say that it was Uriah's baby because David didn't want to take accountability for what he did at that time. Uriah was so invested to the cause of being a soldier that he didn't even go back home and sleep with his wife, but he, he slept outside the kingdom. And then further on in that chapter, we see that, you know, King David made this proclamation like, okay, put Uriah in the front lines, basically ensuring that he would die. And that was also a very manipulative trait. So then when we see Absalom operating in this way, we see some generational things that had to be broken. But of course, um, David f fell into repentance. Um, the son that Bathsheba birthed, the first son would come up very sick and he was sick unto death. The son ultimately died. But before he died, David fell in repentance, just weeping and mourning and fasting. He wasn't eating. He wasn't doing any anything. He fell in repentance in a, in a hopes to save his son. But after the son died and the servants came and told King David that the son had died. Sorry, I didn't have any memory left. But um, what I was trying to sum up was that when it came to David and Bathsheba, when the first son got sick after David, David mourned and fast for his son, you know, hoping that God would come through and, um, you know, heal his son or whatever the case was. After the son died, you know, the servants came and told David and David, you know, he got up from morning and fasting and was like, okay, this is complete. So when we see that verse in, um, when we see that verse in the end of chapter 13 of second Samuel, it's reminding us like, okay, David was comforted because when something is dead, it's like, I don't want to make it sound wrong, but it's just like, it's over with. So he was comforted that Ammon was dead, but he was still longing for Absalom, his son. So now we're going to go on to chapter 14. And this is really going to start getting into Absalom and his, the rest of his behavior. So now... Joab, the son of Zariah, perceived that the king's heart was towards Absalom. And Joab sent to Zekoa and fetched thence a wise woman and said unto her, I pray thee, fringe thyself to be a mourner and put on now mourning apparel and anoint not thyself with oil, but be as a woman that had a long time mourned for the dead. And, it, and come to the king and speak on this manner unto him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. When the woman of Tekoa spake to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and did obeisance and said, help, O king. And the king said unto her, what aileth thee? And she answered, I am indeed a widow woman and my husband is dead. And thy handmaid had two sons and they too strove together in the field and there was none to part them. 
but the one smote the other and slew him. And behold, the whole family is risen against thine handmaid. And they said, deliver him that smote his brother, that we may kill him for the life of his brother whom he slew. And we will destroy the air also. And so they shall quench my coal, which is left. And she shall not leave. And shall not leave to my husband, neither name nor reminder upon the earth. Okay. So Joab tells his wise woman from Tekoa, like, look, come before the king and say this. Come before the king and say, you're a widow. Not, your husband's already gone. And one of your sons killed your other sons. Come before the king and say this. And basically she does. And she tells the king, like, look, everyone in the family is risen up against me. They're saying, hand off the other son so that we can kill him too. But then my husband wouldn't have any remembrance left. There wouldn't be, you know, a namesake for my husband because both the sons would be dead. Verse number eight. And the king said unto her, unto the woman, go to thine house and I will give charge concerning thee. And the woman of Tekoa said unto the king, my lord, O king, the iniquity be on me and on my father's house and the king and his throne be guiltless. And the that can take us completely left if we get into that, but I'm not going to get into that part right now. And the king said, whatever saith ought unto thee, bring him to me and he shall not touch thee anymore. Verse number 11. Then she said, I pray thee, let the king remember the Lord thy God that thou wouldest not suffer the revenge of blood to destroy anymore. Least they destroy my son. And he said, as the Lord liveth, there shall no one hair on thy son fall to the earth. So the king is like, okay, look, I'm going to, I'm going to give charge over thee. No one's going to kill your son. I'm, I'm putting this, I'm putting this out here. No one's going to kill your son. I'm, this is the king's word. So people have to abide to it. Verse number 12. Then the woman said, let thy handmaid, I pray thee speak one more word unto my Lord, the king. And he said, say on. And the woman said, wherefore then has thou thought such a thing against the people of God for the king do a speak this thing as one which is faulty mm. and the king do have not fetch home again his banish so remember Joab put the words in this woman's mouth Joab put the words in this woman's mouth to say to the king now this lady's saying okay you you've given this command you've given this charge over me that they're not going to kill my son but it says, for the king do a speak this thing as one which is faulty. So he's, she's saying like, look, you're given this command that they don't, they shouldn't touch my son. So basically you're, you're saying that this isn't right for them to do that. But you yourself, king, have not fetched home again who you banished. That's what she's saying. And a lot of times, especially when it, there's like these, um, you know, scenarios, because I guess there is something with delivery with how you say things to people or how you how people understand because like I was talking about when it came to Bathsheba and David and the Uriah situation it took a servant to speak this uh, uh, scenario in order for the king to get it on his own had someone just came and bluntly said okay this is this is wrong that you did it may have not went that way so also in this situation Joab put these words in this woman and she brings up the scenario of okay this happened between my sons and one's dead and I'm already a widow. And now she's bringing up saying, okay, King, you recognize that this is faulty, but you yourself haven't fetched home again who you banished being Absalom. But Absalom wasn't banished. Absalom ran off on his own, but King David didn't call him back at this time. Verse number 14, for we must, for we must needs die. And are the waters spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again? Neither do if God respect any person, love that, yet doeth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. So now she's saying, you know, God doesn't respect any persons and all these things. Um, I, I could go off on that, but I'm not trying to because this video is already long. Now, therefore, that I come 
to speak to this thing unto my Lord, the king, it is because the people have made me afraid. And thy handmaid said, 